meeting in order. And, and if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, you have blessed this community with abundance and with thankful hearts we express our gratitude. You have created with us with opportunities to serve other people in their need, to share together in respect and affection, and to be faithful in the responsibilities we have been given. May all that we do this day be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Okay. <coughs> Before we begin from the original agenda, we have some changes uh, on the consent agenda. Item 3B and C have been deleted. Uh, action item 7D and E have been added. Discussion item 9D has been added. And um, item 10C has been added. Are there any other changes to the agenda? <coughs> Hearing none, I'd look for a motion to approve the agenda as modified. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Uh, on the consent agenda, can I get a motion on that? So moved. Second. Second. I have a motion and a lot of Two seconds. seconds. Okay. Three. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. <coughs> With that, we move on to public appearances. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, our June Employee of the Month began working for Orange County in January 2010 and was nominated both by his supervisor and many, many of his peers. This employee has shown exceptional efforts in leadership and management while overseeing the implementation of several tremendous capital pro uh, improvement projects over the past year. He consistently demonstrates professional <coughs> excellence in light of limited staff resources and the constant demands of his department. He has worked diligently with respective departments to ensure the timely and well-organized launch of the MENA software project, the new county website, the VoIP system, along with the demands of his daily work. His positive attitude is both an asset to the county and to his department. His work ethic is a model for all county employees. It is with great pleasure, Mr. Chairman, that I present to the board our Employee of the Month, IT Director Harry Clement. First is Teresa Carroll, who unfortunately can't be with us. She's been with the county for 25 years. She's currently the clerk of the circuit court, and she asked me to read a few words for her. She wanted <coughs> to thank you for this award and announce that it's been a pleasure serving for the last 25 years. She looks forward to serving for many more years to come. The first service award to be presented tonight is to Brad Melson, five years, Orange County Sheriff's Office deputy. So, our <laughs> only award is, yeah, oh. <laughs> is Mr. Brad Taylor, who's been with the county for 10 years, and he's a firefighter medic, and he's one of our captains. Ten years of service. Yeah. <laughs> We're recycling. <laughs> that is some coffee. <laughs> Who said that? Because that's what I was thinking. We we have them. Recycle. Okay. Here's some. It's a crumb. Um. Last but not least, Mr. Jeff Hall, 
apologize to Mr. We Chairman. Orange County values our public safety team <coughs> and their acts of heroism, courage, and fearlessness. And once a quarter, we do have life-saving awards, and this is for the second quarter of the year. In two separate instances, the sheriff's deputies came across victims in distress and immediately went to their aid. On May 13th, 2013, one deputy administered the Heimlich maneuver and cleared the airway of a choking victim, ultimately saving their life. And in a second instance, another deputy was patrolling the area. He approached a flooded roadway and a partially submerged vehicle with a victim inside. He immediately pulled over and rescued the victim and pulled to his safety. And we wanted to thank the brave efforts of these two deputies, both of whose uh, victims are safe and alive today. So it's with great pleasure, Mr. Chairman, that I present to you the second quarter life-saving award recipients with the Orange County Sheriff's Office, Deputy Garcia Madison, and Deputy Christopher Williams. Chairman, we do have the service award for Brad's picture. <laughs> <laughs> Come on back. <laughs> 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 that it? Yes, sir. Okay. Business Spotlight, Faye Gish, owner of Faye's Office Supply. I wrote a speech because I can't remember all this stuff. Um, most of y'all I know, but um, hello, my name is Faye Gish and I'm the president of Faye's Office Supply Incorporated. I would like to thank all of y'all for your service to our county and for giving me the opportunity to spotlight Faye's Office Supply. Phase consists of a retail store that I own and operate on East Main Street. The first, store, the first floor is our store where we take care of walk-ins with orders, copying, faxing, and scanning. The second floor is our business-to-business -business call center. Our call center makes up 90% of what we do. My team processes orders all day by phone calls, faxes, emails, and phase websites where you can place orders online. We receive our orders daily at our warehouse that is located on Bird Street. We pack our orders and then deliver next day to Orange and surrounding counties by our delivery trucks. FaZe is also registered as an independent woman-owned business, which allows us to sell to state agencies such as VDOTs, DMVs, community colleges, correctional centers, and many more. We have the capability to drop ship anywhere in the United States from our 38 warehouses. We have more than office supply. We sell, assemble, and install office furniture. We have a large selection of technology products, anywhere from cartridges, toner, to office equipment such as multifunction printers, fax machines, and scanners. We carry cleaning and break room supplies. We offer custom printing stamps such as business cards, letterhead, forms, self-inking stamps, and much more. We have educational supplies for schools, teachers, students, and parents. You can advertise with their promotional items and get your name out there. Let Phase Office Supply help you with all your office supply needs, and our, our team members are here to assist you. Our slogan is, service and competitive pricing is our way of doing business. Customer service is a big part of what FaZe is all about. My team and I focus on keeping the customer satisfied. As far as competitive pricing, FaZe is part of a national buying group that helps us stay competitive with big boxes. Don't always assume that the big box has the best price. Compare our prices and let FaZe show you where you can save the county and your, bus your business money. Give us the opportunity and we will surprise you. If we can match a price, we will. And that's the best part about FaZe. You can go straight to the top. There's no red tape. We have competitive pricing that the community can, with having competitive pricing, the community can support a local business and keep the tax money coming back into that community. Patty Harlow once said, or Patty Harlow with the Garden Gate once said, we need to think inside the box. Shop and support local first. Look around your community. You will find more than you think. Using businesses that are here today, Use the businesses that are here today because if you don't, they won't be here tomorrow. In 2014, FaZe will be celebrating our 20th year anniversary. 
We are very proud of this. This day and time, it's not easy to keep a business going, and we feel that being in business for 20 years says a lot. I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to share about Faye's office supply, and thank you very much for your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so I did hear her say she doesn't have red tape in her inventory. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Uh, presentation of the Outstanding EMS Agency Award, John Hartness. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Dillard, and I'm the president of the Rappahannock EMS Council. And this afternoon, I've got the distinct pleasure to present an award to your Orange County Fire and Rescue Department. And to give you a little bit of an idea about the significance of this award, the uh, Rappahannock EMS Council covers a very large area. Uh, we cover Planning District 9 and Planning District 16, and that's a population of over 490,000 people and over 2,700 square miles. We've got 60 licensed EMS agencies, and uh, Orange County Fire and EMS is one of those. And we have 1,600 EMS providers and almost 550 licensed EMS vehicles. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the award we're going to be given today. The award for outstanding EMS agency is given to an EMS agency that exemplifies outstanding professionalism and service to its community, whose high level of patient care is evident by innovative training, community awareness, preventative health programs, public relations efforts, and participation in local, regional, and statewide EMS systems. This year's recipient is a shining example of that very description. This agency has completely restructured and revolutionized the way they educate and update their EMS providers. They provide innovative training opportunities, and not only do they provide it to their own people, they share it to the whole region. And they do this with an interactive video training and education on difficult airways and an other advanced training to the providers in the area. They've worked diligently to have progressive medical and patient care protocols, and they have led the region in innovations with patient care and medical technology. They are the first agency in the region to adopt evidence-based patient care protocols, and they are at the leading edge of emerging trends in national patient care. They led the region in using rapid sequence induction airway management, and currently they are the only agency to provide pre-hospital testing of serum lactates. They're very active in the regional EMS system, and they participate in several different committees. Um, they've recently collaborated with the EMS Council on a grant application to propose and to integrate ultrasonography and additional serum testing with ISTAT devices. So um, they've worked tirelessly to enhance the EMS training within their community and to provide the highest level of patient care. So for those significant achievements and accomplishments, we have recognized the Orange County Fire and EMS Department as the 2013 Regional Winner for Outstanding EMS Agency. So at this time, I'd like to present that award and a certificate to uh, the Chief of the Department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to point out before the Chief speaks, uh, this award now goes up to the state level, and in November, the uh, governor will announce the best EMS agency in the state, so Orange County is in, in the running for that now. I just want to first of all thank the Rappahannock EMS Council for recognizing our agency, but there's a few people that we need to thank for this award, the first being Chief Tom Joyce. Chief Joyce is uh, the main reason we're standing up in front of you all today. He's pushed the, all the medical advances throughout the county, not to mention our video program. We also need to recognize Firefighter Bullock that works tirelessly with Chief Joyce to produce our videos, the officers for the department for their leadership, our volunteer fire and EMS partners, our medical director for providing guidance, to the board for providing your support, but most importantly, it's to the men and women out in the field that actually provide the high level of care. So if we could just, uh, Fire and EMS employees stand up and be recognized. Get them up, get them up here for a picture. Right? <laughs> you come up real quick for a picture? Kevin, you want to sure. be in with us? I've even been in one of those videos. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> 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 that's, that's a 
Then we'll move on to public comment. Do we have anybody signed up, Allison? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We have four speakers signed up this evening. Okay. Uh, first speaker is Walt Bearney, 1524 Morris Pond Drive. Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Supervisors, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm speaking on the issue of Signature Station. And I want to make it clear up front that this is the first time that I have appeared before the Board or any other members of the uh, Orange County government to discuss this issue. I have observed uh, previous uh, public hearings and, uh, and attended these. Uh, I've heard comments that it's the same old people that come up and speak in these issues, and I'm not one of those people. Uh, I am a resident of, of uh, Somerset Farm, and uh, I am not opposed to economic development, commercial development, residential development. I am opposed to a haphazard met method of economic development, residential development, commercial development, as it affects the portion of Orange County uh, where I live. Interestingly enough, I just received word that the board has invited the members of the uh, homeowners associations to attend a session on, uh, I believe, June 27th at the Lake of the Woods to discuss economic development in the Route 3 corridor. I guess my question is then, why will there be a vote tonight on approval of Signature Station without more discussion? If any of you haven't seen uh, uh, the commercial strip as you drive through Branson, Missouri, where developers went wild to develop whatever they want, I don't want to see that happening in Orange County. Just because we're tucked off in an area of the county where, you know, the rest of the county seems to think it's okay for development up there as long as it doesn't affect us. That's wrong. It's wrong. And I hope, and I hope that you will reconsider the approval of Signature Station as it is being offered now. It's not personal, it's business. And I just think that uh, it's necessary for you to take this into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Darren. Good afternoon, members of the board. My pleasure to again be able to speak before you. I've been a taxpayer in Orange County for over 10 years now, and I'd like to ask you for a refund, a refund of some of my tax dollars that you wasted in 2008 when you produced the Orange County proffers guidelines. I consider that a waste because they're not being read, they're being ignored by the developers, and I'm not even sure you have read those guidelines because if you had, you would be aware that Signature Station isn't within 10% of what you offer as guidelines, not 30%, not 50%, not 70%, not even 90%. And you now then want me to pay the extra infrastructure costs instead of the developers and other interested people in the county. We're going to get stuck with that bill. So why do we have to rezone this property now? Our comprehensive plan is under revision. We have a land use map that is not yet completed. And as Mr. Deering said, on the 27th, we've been invited to attend an economic development vision plan for Route 3. But that plan has no current input from anyone living within three to five miles of the Route 3 corridor. Let's postpone this decision. And Again, Mr. Supervisor, Chair, I think it would be appropriate if you would recuse yourself from this vote so that you would avoid any hint of any possible conflict of interest in land use areas within the Germana Corridor. I'm asking you all to deny this rezoning at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. The Next. third speaker we have signed up is Marguerite Jones. <coughs> No 
idea what he was going to say. These are my comments. So, um, our Somerset Farm Homeowners Association has an architectural review board, as do most homeowner associations throughout the con country. The reason for these review boards is to assure that any changes that an owner chooses to make to their property conform to the guidelines of that community. If the requested changes do not meet the criteria, the ARB has the authority to reject them and the owner must then modify their original plan. The same holds true with towns and counties. All landowners have an obligation to submit proposals for changes, whether it be building permits or zone rezoning permits. The governing bodies of these towns or counties have the duty to see to it that these changes are, first of all, in compliance with all of the guidelines of that particular town, county, etc., and secondly, that it will benefi benefit the entire community. Adding an additional 230 townhomes to the northwest corner of Routes 3 and 708 without sufficient industry to support them and without adequate cash proffers would be irresponsible on the part of the board. The signature station rezoning request will not benefit the entire Orange County community, will likely increase county taxes over time, and will adversely affect the lives of 260 families in the Somerset Farm subdivision. Decisions about this parcel of land should be part of the June 27th meeting for the three major subdivisions along Route 3 to discuss future development on the Route 3 corridor and the ap application for rezoning should be denied today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. <coughs> the last speaker is Stephanie Williams, 1168 Spencer Drive. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Super, not supervisors. I have spoken before. I've spoken at the Planning Commission. I've spoken at the um, board um, hearing on the um, Walmart issue. And I'm here again speaking because I live a mile and a half behind the intersection of where Walmart and now the consideration of Signature Station is. And it's, in, it's very important to me, my family, and my community. Does the board really want the Route 3 corridor to be like everywhere else? Unfortunately, it seems that you do. The board's poised to approve Signature Station, ignoring public testimony and the opposition of nearby residents, and without reasonable cash proffers to protect all of the Orange County taxpayers. The board did not even attempt to negotiate its own proffer policy. Consequently, if the project's approved, all current citizens, well as Bob Jones said, will pay for the facilities needed to serve the increased population. And there will be an increased population if the townhouses go through, because with 230 townhouses, you're certainly going to have a lot more kids uh, than the uh, studies have shown for the county appropriate uh, a county area. You may say that residents haven't voiced strong or numerous opposition. Frankly, after the fiasco of the Walmart approval process, what's the point? Our own District 4 Supervisor Wilson had a pre-prepared statement that was read by Supervisor Frame moving to grant the big box zoning after more than a dozen affected residents and Germana County, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Germana Community College spoke in opposition. A very modest minority were in favor of its location. Signature Station will use the same road, Route 708, for entrance. The Board of Supervisors, um, Chairman Goodwin from District 3, was quoted in the June 6th Orange County Review in regard to opening the new Walmart. The store works well in what we're trying to accomplish on the Route 3 corridor. Well, who is we? The we must be the board. It would be nice if the residents most impacted by these bright ideas had a say. It's also telling that the June 8th Freelance Star article on Walmart's Route 3 and 708 opening, set for June, July 10th, says the Superstore will serve a seven-mile radius. 
Seven miles doesn't even come close to becoming strategically located to serve the majority of Orange County residents. A letter in the same June 6th Orange County Review noted Mr. Goodwin's extensive real estate holdings in the Route 3 area and suggested he recuse himself from a vote on the signature station proposal. I agree and suggest that he recuse himself from all land use decisions in the corridor, including the comprehensive plan and any actions on zoning and subdivision ordinances. As uh, Bob Jones also mentioned and Walt Deering did about the board working on the comprehensive plan and the economic development, well, the current draft reads like a plan for economic development more than a serious guide to land use in the county over the next several years. Again, the major focus for development is Route 3. Many of us in the Route 3 area may live on relatively small lots, but we value and generally, we value the generally rural nature of the county and the lack of congestion when we leave our subdivisions. We do not want our area to become more highly congested than the imminent opening of Walmart is forcing upon us. Even with the new road infrastructure enhancements, ingress and egress from Somerset Farm and Wilderness Shore are already showing signs of bottlenecking. We want the Board of Supervisors to take our concerns seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, with that, on to board comment. On Friday evening, uh, I was contacted about the Boys and Girls event on Saturday, and the tent was in issue of being passed. And uh, there had been some modifications made so that the tent could pass. And so with that, I was able to get in touch with GW, have GW go back out and approve the tent so that the event went flawlessly on Saturday night. And I would just like to thank GW for going above and beyond on his own time Friday night to take care of that. I thought it was an excellent job, and I appreciate it. Particularly since we were both there and we didn't want the tent to fall on us, so. <laughs> Not my corner. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, on to the action items. The application by signature series. <coughs> or do we have anything to discuss? I have a question for the county attorney if I might. <coughs> uh, there was one, one change in the uh, offers that you we're discussing as of last Friday, the last version. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me the status of that? Well, there's actually a couple of changes. Oh, but I'm talking about the one that, that uh, with your change, your suggested change that dealt with the, uh, 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 let's see, on, if I, let me point you to the right uh, uh, item. I don't have that copy with me. I think it was, uh, yeah. I'm surprised you don't. It, it not, I mean, I'm not going to be funny. It, the, the proffers changed um, so much. What's, what's it dated? I don't even know that they're even dated anymore. I tried June 6th. Yeah, June 6th is the most current. All right, so even the June 3rd that's on the Internet is wrong. Yeah, there was a June 6th version that went out Friday evening. There, there were a couple of issues. Buffering, is that the, the issue that you're interested in, Mr. White? Uh, no, that one, that one was uh, my issue. No. And then there was one about the SUP language. Yeah, thank you. That's the one. It was okay. the SUP language uh, and the, uh, the issue of as of what date. Well, that was, uh, yeah. And that was the one I was, I hadn't heard the final status of that one. Well, the, the actual version that's proffered 
that was proffered by the applicants this evening, and it's also the one I sent out on Friday, is that, remember the, the, SU, the applications, or the proposal here, the proffer says they can't build any residential until they built 25% of the commercial. Then they proffered, or if somebody makes an application for an SUP, which would be 60,000 square feet or more, if somebody makes an application for an SUP, and I added language that had to be a bona fide application, fully complete, and it isn't acted upon within six months by the Planning Commission, the applicant added uh, language is saying, in accordance with the special use permit guidelines as of the date of this proffer statement. Because, and that was the, the issue. My language did not have. I simply said it had to be a bona fide application. They added language that said, bona fide as determined by today's standards, not by, because they were worried about some standard in the future that might change. And so that was added by the applicant at the bottom of the very last sentence on the bottom of the second page. Yep. And that's, that sentence is included in the official proffer which I've given to the clerk. That, that was my question. Yeah. I got a couple of questions with regard to that. Uh, it only requires approval by the Planning Commission. So if the thing is approved by the Planning Commission, then they can go ahead. Well, actually, if it's not no, acted on, no. it's not acted on by the if it's If it's been acted on. If it's acted on, then it has to continue the process. If they, if the Planning Commission acts, recommends approval or whatever, then. Or recommends disapproval. I would say then we're fine. And then they it doesn't can't. say approve. It just needs to It doesn't to say approve. If the, if the Planning Commission hasn't done something with it and say, hasn't acted on it in okay. six months, then they can go ahead and start. So if it doesn't get approved. That would not give them the ability to build. To go ahead with the residential. Have to come to the board. Correct. Or if it gets approved by the planning commission, it doesn't get approved by the supervisor. <coughs> or doesn't even get acted on by the supervisor. Still would not give them the ability to start construction. What if for some reason we have, uh, in terms of doing other things with regard to our master planning, we, uh, uh, we change our zoning ordinance such that we no longer have a, a uh, big box ordinance? How would that fit? I would definitely throw that proffer into question whether it's still applicable or not because it's based on the fact that you've got to do an SUP application on a big box. So if there's no requirement for an SUP? Then they would probably be released from the second part of that proffer. Correct. But, they st but then they wouldn't have to have the 25% built before the uh, start residential? Well, I would say if... If we amended and eliminated the big box ordinance and you mm -hmm. didn't have to apply for an SUP, uh -huh. then um, it makes that second paragraph meaningless because there would be no process where that occurred. So if it became meaningless, then the only valid legal interpretation would be only the first paragraph still, or the first sentence still applies. The first sentence would still apply. The first sentence would still apply because the, if you look at this, the second one, the residential construction may also begin. So the first sentence is one way it may begin once you've done 25% of the commercial. Uh -huh. the, the second sentence provides it may also begin if an SUP application is made. And not but if there's no requirement for an SUP application, then, then that second the sentence, sentence, sentence could never happen. Okay. All right. But that would should alleviate the, the applicant's concern they voiced to me was that they bring a legitimate business and it gets delayed more than six Understand. months. So that Understand. Was, I don't think the applicant cares if that happens. So that's correct. Okay. All right. Any further questions? Do I have a motion? Motion says I Grover Wilson, supervisor for District 4, would like to make a motion to rezone 75.8 acres from agricultural to approximately 47 acres of multifamily residential R4 and approximately 28 acres of general commercial C2 with proffers as proposed by the applicant. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? I second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna support this uh, rezoning, and I'll go ahead and explain my reasons. 
Uh, our current comp plan calls for this area to be mixed use. Uh, I don't consider this mixed use. Uh, admittedly, uh, we have not provided specific zoning guidance in terms of describe what we mean by mixed use, but this doesn't seem to me to be mixed use. I would consider uh, a residential and, uh, uh, and commercial integrated what you would more find in a town center, so I don't, I don't consider this. I think we have two separate uh, uh, rezonings here, one for commercial, one for residential, and I don't, don't consider it a uh, mixed use. Second, um, I don't believe the applicant's financial analysis that indicates the residential pays for itself. Uh, he used, uh, the an analyst used a pupil generation rate, which, uh, uh, which he got from our proffer guidance, so I can't fault him for that. But in fact, uh, he indicated that that is much too low, or it is too low, and that uh, if our generation had been to, uh, uh, student generation had been similar to other counties around here for that kind of housing, that it would not have paid for itself. We basically can expect an influx of new families, and I don't think we can expect that to uh, maintain an abnormally, abnormally low pupil generation rate. Another thing that I didn't like about the financial analysis, it only con considers the current debt for the county's capital investment. It only talks about debt service costs. This is true for both the schools and the other county capital investments. The actual capital investments required for, uh, for a community involves more than just what we haven't paid for yet. There's a whole bunch that we, we uh, uh, have already paid for, and uh, we will need to uh, uh, expand on that as well as those things that we haven't paid for. So I think that uh, that analysis only looks at a portion of the, uh, of the costs. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't like the proffer for uh, uh, the buffer. I preferred the one that uh, uh, Greg had uh, stated, uh, but that's not a, that's not a critical we're about to embark on a Route 3 corridor master plan. And we're talking about trying to get, uh, to help the, the economic uh, uh, situation in the uh, tax base in the county. I go to the uh, Virginia Economic Development uh, Guidelines for, uh, or uh, guides for, uh, uh, for local government. And they mention here, and I'll read a paragraph out of that, the foundation of any local economy is jobs, especially those jobs from basic employees, those that manufacture, distribute goods, set up headquarters, cater to tourists, or perform other functions that draw new income into the regional economy. Uh, wages earned, earned at these basic jobs are then spent within the community and support non-basic employment such as retail. Therefore, successful economic development efforts are designed to protect jobs already in existence as well as attract new basic jobs from outside the community. I don't see this does it. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is we're about to embark on this uh, Route 3 corridor master plan. I think this, uh, we may very well include the commercial and residential in this area, but until we know specifically what the citizens want and have the ordinances in place to make it happen as the citizens want, we should not limit the future options with this rezoning. Now, the other element, and uh, there was a recent article in the uh, uh, Virginia uh, business talked about water supply, and uh, one of the uh, major points in that article was that uh, water use may not be a major concern for most Virginia families, but increasingly it is a driving force behind decisions in the boardroom. It is the single largest risk to your business. I've, uh, 
even more than energy, water is a basis of the economy. Major corporations recognize this risk to their bottom line. Now, if we've reproved this, are we putting ourselves to the point of not being able to uh, add anything more? No, this doesn't take us to our limit. But in fact, it starts to use water that I think would be better uh, spent uh, on, uh, uh, better directed towards businesses that are going to bring new, uh, new funds into the economy and into the county. Uh, so I think that uh, for these reasons, uh, I'm not going to support this uh, rezoning. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, I have some comments. Unless, Jim, you wanted to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, too, do not anticipate on supporting um, this for um, many of the reasons that um, Lee just stated, but to keep from being redundant, I won't um, repeat them. I, I will say that the commercial component of this um, is desirable. Um, there, are, there are things about that that I know that there are many citizens that live on the eastern end of the county that talk to me that they say that they want to be able to have um, those options close to them. So if this were strictly a commercial rezoning, um, I, would, I would have less heartache voting for it. Um, in the new comprehensive plan draft, there's a statement in there right now that says anytime that we look at a proposal, it should outweigh, the public need should outweigh the public cost. But I think that unfortunately, the scale is tipped in the other direction. There is no public need for 230 townhomes right now. Um, but however, there's going to be a phenomenal public cost and, and not just monetary, it's, it's a quality of life issue. Um, I, I, hear, I, I hear you say, um, you know, you're gonna build these higher income townhomes, but then I also hear um, from people who've spoke with you that you're gonna sell it. So what you're promising and what is gonna be reality, I don't know if you sell it, you put a for sale sign out there tomorrow and Bob's builder comes through what you say you're going to do isn't what Bob's going to do. Um, the comment that was made a little while ago about um, the other end of the county thinking that all the development should go down to Route 3 and look bad. I, I don't, I'm not going to disagree with what that person said. I, I think that there are people that live east of, or excuse me, west of 522 that basically say they don't care what happens on the eastern end of the county. It doesn't affect them, but it does affect us because twice a year we get a tax bill from what happens on the eastern end of the county. Um, when you say, or your financial analysis says that it's gonna net generate revenue, I find that hard to believe that it's not gonna impact the home values of the citizens who live in Somerset Farms. Um, I, I just have, I have, I, I mean, I'm not an economist, so I guess it'll just have to, the proof will be in the pudding. Um, another thing is I had a developer, and I'll leave him nameless because I don't want to throw anything out there, but he called me shortly after the last meeting and, and, and told me, he said, I'm coming in immediately with the rezoning. I hope y'all don't put, make them do any more proffers than y'all are doing right now because I'm not gonna do any more either. And he said, you've set a precedent. If you vote for this, you set the precedent and I am coming in with my rezoning. He also said that to, that to the board, we look like we have been so business unfriendly for so long that we're trying to change that persona that we are grabbing anything that goes by so we look like we're business friendly. Um, I think we, as elected officials, um, whether <laughs> whether it's right or wrong, we get picked to make hard, tough decisions. And again, I will say, I'll say 50 times, if this was just the commercial component of it, I, and it, I wouldn't be as heartbroken over this. Um, there is no way these townhomes are gonna be high-end townhomes. It, it, it's not possible. It, it's just not possible. I've never driven by a high-end townhome next to a Walmart. <laughs> it, 
It just, I haven't seen it. Um, and then unfortunately for the citizens that live in Somerset Farms, I, I am sorry. I, I truly feel sorry for you all. Um, now, but on the flip side of that, it has been in the comprehensive plan that this area is got some economic development potential. But I think we have failed the citizens of Route 3 for not putting in stronger protections to make sure that what you get built up around you is something you'd want to live around. Um, I, I do think it's a misconception that people move that live on Route 3 want it to be like Spotsylvania. Because if they wanted it to be like Spotsylvania, you wouldn't have left Spotsylvania. You already had it there. I, I think people from Lake of the Woods, I mean, we say we want to be able to shop, but they don't want the congestion. They don't want the higher tax rates. And this is what this is going, this is what this is going to cause. I think another funny comment during the Walmart process, everybody stood up and talked about the jobs, that we needed the jobs, we needed the jobs. And at a recent planning commission meeting, there were planning commission members making fun of the low wage jobs at Walmart. The same planning commission members who said at their planning commission hearing that we needed the jobs. We sound schizophrenic. We're, we're doing a plan on Route 3. What's the point of spending the $10,000 that we're getting ready to spend and the countless hours that we're getting ready to spend to do a plan on Route 3 when anything goes. Because when this second developer comes in and asks for his rezoning, we're going to have to give it to him. And he's ready. So we're going to have to give him that. And then when the next one comes in, we're going to have to give him that. I don't understand what the point of the plan. I, I unfortunately think that it's just lip service to sound good. I mean, I think we want to have a good plan but we're doing this, and this just unfortunately, um, to me, is, is not a good plan. It is not a plan. It's, it's a rezoning that allows um, a landowner to put a for sale sign out tomorrow and make more money, which rock on, I'm all about making money, but not at the cost of the other 35,000 taxpayers who live in Orange County. And then lastly, you know, in 2006, the board unanimously voted this down. And I asked a question of one of my fellow board members, and I said, what has changed? And he, he responded to me, and he said, Walmart. Well, if Walmart is all that's changed between the board in 2006 voting against it and today, I'm, I'm a little, I would hope we would set our standards a little bit higher than just Walmart. But um, so unfortunately, I'm not voting for it, but if it were just commercial, I would. A couple of comments, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, first of all, in an ideal world, a lot of the things that uh, the two members of the board that have spoken already would, would, be, uh, would be the case. Certainly, I wish we had made a lot more progress in developing our plan for the area. Uh, it, it's been banded around and discussed for at least the last four or five years. Uh, absolutely nothing has been done. Uh, as to the proffers, I wish everybody had read the proffer policy of the county, and you would find that it is essentially not worth the papers written on because it calls for things that we have no plans to provide. Another new middle school? Are you kidding me? Water and sewer lines? The county's not even in the business. Transportation? The county's not even in the business. A high school? Nowhere in the plan. These are the things that we can take money for if we had a proffer policy that was something other than, that intended to be something other than a punitive document, which this one clearly was when it was put in place back in 2008. What we're faced with is, is the reality that we have an applicant that legally owns the land, has followed the process that this board and previous boards have laid out in terms of making application. They have received a, a positive recommendation from staff review, a positive recommendation from the Planning Commission review. Uh, they have adjusted the proffers based on comments at public hearings as well as comments from, from staff and attorney and, and the like. Are they perfect? Of course not. Proffers probably never are. But it's certainly a set of conditions that, that make up, frankly, for some of the holes in the county's policy, uh, such as architectural or design standards, which we don't have. 
we should have, but we don't. Uh, and I'm unwilling to hold the applicant or any other landowner for that matter responsible for uh, omissions or failures or limitations uh, on the part of the county. Uh, it's my understanding that we essentially have three choices with respect to denying an application like this. We can deny it because it's unreasonable. Unreasonable means something like putting a nuclear power plant in the middle of a subdivision. That's unreasonable. We can deny it because it's reasonable, but the landowner has the option of uh, having some economically viable use based on its current zoning. Well, its current zoning is ag, uh, and in the area that it's located, uh, it, 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 you'd be hard pressed to define a, an economically viable use, certainly other than planting some more trees and waiting 25 or 30 or 40 years. But probably the most important one is, uh, is a matter of the uh, protection, equal protection. If you have similarly situated property in similar locations proposing similar uses that have been approved by the county, Walmart, the pad sites around Walmart, the hundreds of other townhomes that are within a good golf swing of this location, you, you, you are not in a position to deny a rezoning just because you want to say no. There has to be another basis for that. <coughs> Again, I wish we were further ahead in our planning. I wish we had design standards in place. I wish we had a proffer policy that was meant to raise money for the county to have help offset the cost. I am told that the current proffer policy, which was put in place in 2008, has never benefited the county one dime. You ask yourself why? Could it be partly the policy itself? It's partly the economy without question, but there are other problems with it. So uh, absolutely, in an ideal world, we'd find ourselves in a dis different position, but this appears to me to be a case where uh, <coughs> the, the boxes have been checked, the process has been followed, <coughs> um, and other than wanting to just say no, uh, we, we have, we're in a position where this needs to be moved forward. We need to move forward with our planning process and try to get out ahead of this. I described it to somebody very recently that without question, this is like laying track in front of a moving train. But, you know, it is what it is. If we could back the clock up to 2008 or 7 or 10, pick, it, pick your year, I can point to events in any of those years that should have taken place that didn't. Uh, we might find ourselves in a different situation, but here we are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Jim, I just want to add on that. That's why I didn't mention the proffers. I just don't flat think it's, I mean, I'm not mentioning the proffers because like Jim, <coughs> Jim stated, the, um, the, the, the proffers do, um, <coughs> you know, is. Um, they ask for things that no longer exist in the uh, TIP. Actually, if you look at the uh, if you look at the amount of money that they're expecting to generate from the commercial, <coughs> and look at the carrying costs of the amount of the proffers, the generated uh, revenue from the commercial, ignoring the uh, any revenue from the uh, residential, uh, would more than cover the carrying costs of the proffers. So it's a little hard to argue that the proffers are the, the driving force on this. But I, I mentioned it partly because it was it had been mentioned in several of the, <coughs> of the public hearing comments and, and, and others, uh, and, and I, I share the concern that our proffer policy is 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 not operative, and that we need to address it. Uh, I guess maybe this is more of a question for later, but uh, I'll get to the bottom of it. We actually, I, I find it difficult that we actually can't vote for denial because if not, there wouldn't be a copy of a draft um, ordinance of denial. Um, you know, and the reason could be just good zoning practice does not support approval of this rezoning. Um, the Board of Supervisors has determined that public necessity, convenience, gen welfare, general welfare, and good zoning practices. So we actually, because I don't want people, all the landowners on Route 3 now to think that all they have to do is check all the boxes and they can come forward and do a rezoning. We, we do have the right to deny something because it's just not good zoning practice. But. Um, 
I would be reluctant to deny anybody else that came in with the same kind of proposal. Just because uh, that would be the <coughs> obvious uh, uh, example of. Well, the only thing that separates this property from a property that went through that process is a, is a road that's about 50 feet wide. Well, no, the other, I mean, the other was rezoned many years ago. Uh, it was rezoned before our existing uh, comp plan came into place. <coughs> so if we, if this is our new standard. Uh, I, I, well, I, I don't want it to become our new standard. I, I think we need to, to move forward and, and change some of the ways that we address these things. But we haven't. As of this date, we can't we can't hold up a standard that we don't have as the test, and I think that's probably the part that concerns me the most. Is we 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 would like to apply standards that we don't have. I might even like to apply some different standards, but I I don't believe that we're in that position. We've used uh, we've used since we don't we haven't had standards. We've been using the zoning and the proper process Proffers. as the basis of trying to uh, develop standards. I agree. That's not, not going to work. Not going to work. Yeah. Obviously, not tonight. <laughs> okay. Any further comment? Roll call. Mr. Goodwin. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Mr. Freeman. Nay. Mr. Babb. Nay. Mr. White. Aye. Motion carries three two. Okay. Next item, transfer from the contingency fund for e grant software, Glenda. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, since February of this year, um, Stephanie Straub, who's here tonight, um, she's our procurement and grant coordinator, has been researching uh, qualified companies for grant software systems. Um, we were interested in getting some software that would help us um, identify state and federal and other types of grants um, too. With our new MUNA software, um, we're expecting to, to get some abilities to manage the grants, but just um, uh, being able to identify grants that are available, get examples of successful applications and that sort of thing. Um, we needed to look a little further. So the eCivis uh, software is available and it seems to be uh, fairly popular in Virginia. I know the town of Orange uh, purchased it recently and there are several other localities that are using it. Um, but first, it would provide access to all federal, state, nonprofit, and foundation grants in the country with this grant research module um, and that module would allow the staff to search for grants, establish email alert notifications when grants for a particular uh, function became available, um, compare and contrast funding sources and award eligibilities as well. Um, secondly, there's a knowledge database uh, that provides samples of award-winning applications and also has online courses aimed at increasing award rates. Um, lastly, the eCivis provides effective communication um, by allowing all the departments to virtually coordinate the drafting, writing, and submitting of applications so that um, other departments could work with Stephanie and um, access those databases and uh, just uh, streamline the whole process of those searching and applying for grants. Um, we have seen a demo of the software. We also invited department heads in to see the software to see if they would find it beneficial. And um, there was a whole lot of interest in it. And after much discussion with the company, um, we have gotten a quote for them. Uh, for seven logins with access to the grant research and knowledge database uh, for $7,500 a year with a three-year contract. So we're requesting that the board allow us to um, commit to that um, through contingency for FY13 and FY14 um, if you so desire. 
Now you're, you're, you're this, but we would go ahead. We're talking about going ahead with a three-year contract, exactly. but we're, we're just talking about the funding for this year and next year. Exactly. 7501. <laughs> Nothing like precision. <laughs> 74, 99, 99. So. <laughs> okay. I guess the question I have, and, and, and maybe it needs to be answered outside the, the context of this uh, uh, action item, but um, as I read the, the fact that it could be used by 10 different departments and there are seven different logins and these kind of things, I guess I, my, my question, and maybe it's a question to, to you, Julie, uh, that I'd admit to being somewhat unfair in asking, uh, is do we have a plan of how we want to utilize this, how we're going to organize ourselves, or are we just are we going to make it available to all departments and they individually take the responsibility for trying to find opportunities, or are we going to have some somewhat more organized or, or concentrated focus on these things? I guess I, software like this could be, you know, very useful uh, under a certain environment, but it also can sit around and not pay its way if, if it's not getting enough attention. So I'm, I just want to make sure that we've given some thought <laughs> or plan to have some thought given to how we're going to make this worthwhile. The only way the software will be useful is if we actually use it. And one of the things that I think you'll be pretty impressed by looking at is the work that's been done by Stephanie and Brenda so far. Um, Stephanie has reams of papers with tabs and color coding to try to keep all of this uh, straight and instead of having to do everything by hand and the, the collaboration with the department heads, it can be done um, somewhat electronically and also be attached to our financial software. Part of the reason why we have 10 departments interested in seven logins, we have Jason Woods, for instance, who is admin for both Parks and Rec and Tourism. So we don't buy the extra login, we have that one to two different departments and and also, I suppose, Office on Youth. And is that a vendor requirement to have it, uh, have each, in essence, each department have its own uh, login? Is that the way they, well, I mean, I'm, su I'm sure some vendors would like that because it's, they well, license it's it that way. It's requirement to have a security cost because you pay by the login, right. but it's also, um, the vendor will direct, we, we put in parameters <coughs> for what kind of grants we're interested in, whether it be the topic or the amount or the source, and the vendor will automatically shoot to different registered folks those grants and so that way Stephanie doesn't have to get 300 emails to then say okay these five go to Parks and Rec and these ten go to Fire and EMS and well this one goes to the sheriff and whatever so um, with the different logins and the different specific registrations individual people identified the staff will get those automatically. So they do some of the screening for us then? Based on what? And, and, yeah, and I the think other thing I is you can see the former applications. If you can see 10 applications that were successful, you can say, well, they all included this data and they all had um, these figures. And, and you can make sure that you have good examples for some of these grant applications since we don't have you know, a whole team of grant writers on site. So it's $1,000 si per sign in or it's? Per login. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a certain well, amount. And, and then yeah. there's. Yeah, so it, I'm, it I'm was unlimited, I think, for what, 30,000? 30, 30,000 was unlimited log no, on. 30,000 total? Mm -hmm. uh, per year, I per believe. Year. Okay, but what I'm saying is, so what was the base cost? Like, let's, what's the base cost with one? Because what's the base cost for one login? Well, I think it, they have a pricing uh, that depends on your population. So, um, you know, the town of Orange would pay a lesser rate than Orange County um, but the Isn't for two 3,500 3, was the absolute smallest that we could get right, so it's, yeah okay I was just kind of wondering because you know we might just be talking about a little just a little bit of money for mm -hmm. seven when if if this who are the seven um, we have kind of boiled down a list from the people that came to our, do, do you have that with you by any chance? Does that include the Sheriff's Department? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They came and, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, I think our ideal, when, you know, when we had the departments come in and they responded back with, yes, they were interested and um, that, you know, we'd love to have more logins than seven, but seven was kind of uh, 
the point that we thought um, it was enough that we can sort of test the system and like you say there's you know the concern that uh, we want to make sure that we do use it and it doesn't you know um, so who are the seven have you got So the schools couldn't utilize something like this? They would be, I don't believe, they, they would be their own separate <coughs> entity, I believe. Um, I don't know that we've asked. C can we reassign the seven? Let's say you, that your list is the current mm -hmm. seven and we decide two months from now that we should drop one entity or combine two others, or do, do we have flexibility to do that? I would think so. I it's think it's just it was IT wide. Yeah. yeah. Because I would like to know if the schools could get in on this because at the same time, I don't know how many grants administration is going to be s searching for versus, you know, if the schools could get in on that, mm -hmm. you know. Do we know is, the, is, is part of their coverage well, grants be, that the school would be interested in it or do we know? You know, I'd be glad to talk to them about it. I, I honestly had not because I, I, you know, thought that they probably are um, – have someone you know that that does uh, researching for grants specifically for education, but I, I mean I'm glad to talk to Matt about it. And does see the what they does do. the does this system, do you know if it even uh, uh, goes after it includes education grants? I, would, I agree with that. I believe it goes all. It goes all all grants. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I think it's. I mean, is there a, a critical thing of a decision tonight or? Can we ask and look at the uh, schools? On well, this? I, I think um, the the critical point will be June thirtieth because we need to be able to place an order in order for them to honor this pricing. Um, so uh, we could do it possibly at your next meeting. Well, after we, the even if we the change discussion. logins, I mean, if in well, that's what I'm saying. If if Office on Youth <laughs> Tourism and could be one with administration, you know, if you Edmund doesn't have one, Stephanie has one, and she was going to allow us to, you know, ask her questions, but Edmund doesn't have one. But she said her and admin. I mean, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, oh. if it could be. Yeah, but she's got, she basically is focal point for everybody. Mm -hmm. And this, th does this allow them to, to not have to focus everything through you? They, do you still need to be involved in all the grants then, all the grant applications? They can do the research on their own, yes, sir. and they and they also get access to. Uh, are there other uh, services that provide people? Uh, uh, in other words, uh, fire and EMS. I know that they go looking for grants, and uh, they talk to me about them a lot. And and I'm just wondering, uh, is there are there other services that uh, provide uh, uh, grant information to uh, various entities? Other departments. Well, I'm thinking, does Fire and EMS have a service they can sign up for to look at grants? To get grants? Not that is as comprehensive as eCivis. Okay, so this this covers everything. Yes, sir. Others would be more specific. But it, I don't have a problem going ahead with this. Uh, but I would, uh, well, if we could move the logins, if we can, if we if we control the assignment of the logins, which means we could have one for the schools if it was something they could use or were interested in. Uh, or move them among our departments, then, uh, then that flexibility uh, I'll makes me come. We, uh, make the motion. Yeah, because I mean, no one's going to, I'll second it, but I'll just follow up with saying, you know, no one's going to be sitting there 40 hours a week um, going through this. So if Nikki and, um, I'm drawing a blank, if 911 and emergency services yeah. has to use the same login, it's not that they're all going to be on it at the same time. Well, looking it, it up it, it could be too that <coughs> there are specific things that one department's looking for and once they get it they don't need it for a couple months then yeah. we can sure. move it around yeah. so yeah. okay all right so i have a motion and a second any further discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. okay thank, thank you, you.
And next would be the self-funded insurance option, Ms. Julie. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we discussed at the last meeting um, the idea of self-funded insurance options for the county. Since the last meeting, the school board has met and discussed this, and they voted to approve moving the self-funded insurance, assuming that the board of supervisors also wanted to do that. Social services also has no objection to migrating to self-funded insurance at this time. So the matter stands before you. Um, all three parties are in agreement to move forward. If uh, the board so wishes, I and move that we move to self-funded insurance options. Second. And a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, just an item that relates to this. We, we need, uh, it's my understanding, we need to make an explicit decision at some point uh, as to where we, who holds the reserves and what we do with it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't have to be part of tonight, but I want to make sure that we get that on the agenda, you know, in plenty of time to deal with that and see what our options are. Okay. <coughs> uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, next would be the Vesta Palace system upgrade. And since Mickey cannot be here, Julie. Yes, sir. Um, a while back, we discussed the need for a new phone system for 911. The phone system is at end of life. We're no longer to get able to get parts or be able to change or expand our system or even replace parts of our system without going on eBay and um, finding parts. Um, the, the software is also no longer supported as of um, 2014 and proactively Ms. Tidy went and got a grant for the exact amount that we believe the system to be, the, the estimate that was given us. The estimate was for about $131,000. Since getting the estimate and getting the grant, we uh, put the bid out. The bid came back much higher than that at $212,000. Um, the technology changed in the process of doing all of this, as did some of the enhancements and some of the um, requirements. Ms. Tidy went back and got an additional $19,000 to get the maximum amount allowable, which is $150,000 towards this program. and. Um, the, the balance remains to get this system. One good thing that we have going for us is that Verizon already has a maintenance agreement with us every year, which is more than the $19,000 a year that would be needed for the next um, few years to finish out the payment to get the $212,000. So what Ms. Tidy has put before you is a grant for $150,000, a financing option for the deficit um, between the 150 and the 212, the $62,000, and also funds within her department to be able to pay for that financing, and that's the issue before you. Do we have any idea what the imputed interest rate is that they're charging? Zero. Is it zero? Okay. Yes, sir. That's not bad. That's that's a pretty good <laughs> interest rate. <laughs> they have any more of that? <laughs> well, you're trying to invest in that. Yeah. I <laughs> I have some of those. <laughs> <laughs> They're called notes in the bank. <laughs> <coughs> we will have to make a um, amendment to the budget to, ref to reference the, the, the payment of, of this as debt, um, the $19,000, but that's part of the motion that's before you. She says she's got enough in her, in her operating fund to do that? Um, yes, sir. The this 62? is in lieu of the Verizon wire, of the Verizon contract. So okay. that contract goes away. Right. She has a maintenance fee for Verizon, and we're using that maintenance fee for this, make this interest up. rate because we wouldn't, or this interest payment, we wouldn't, um, okay. I'm sorry, not interest payment, but principal payment or whatever. And, and if I under understood you, the, the payment, the maintenance payment to Verizon is greater than the 19 two. Yes, sir. It's not much. It's not much greater. But but, it, but that I mean it's. It's same an excess of that. Well, where's the, the extra fifty two coming from? Then? It's this spread over, over the years. A number of years at zero interest. They're going to allow us to uh, pay it over three years. 
four years. Four years, I guess you count two, four, five. Right. Eight. Oh, okay, so that's the, all right. So basically we put a big down payment of 150 down, and then years two, three, four, and five, we're gonna pay 19, two, 29, 90. All right, okay. So we're getting a $213,000 system for four payments of $19,000. Yes, sir. So moved. Second. <laughs> Woo! Any further discussion? Let's, and let's please hurry up and do it before the technology changes again and the price <laughs> doubles again. All we'll be favor, back to eBay. All in favor say <laughs> aye. 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 <laughs> okay, last is the public comment period for Road 3 Corridor Initiative. Julie? Yes, Mr. Chairman, the, um, the county has embarked upon a, a process to talk about the Route 3 Corridor, and one of the things that was discussed in a, a meeting that was internal with um, Supervisor Frame, Supervisor White, and some staff was the desire for public input in this um, discussion. Of course, we're having some public meetings and we will be continuing along this process, but like we did for the redistricting effort, the suggestion was made that we have a special time for public comment and perhaps three in the next few months, one before the retreat, one after the retreat, and one at another time for the public to be able to come in and and let the board know what they think. There, there isn't a particular um, way to have this during joint retreats and other such things. So um, what was proposed in that internal meeting that's before you now is the announcement of three dates for the public to be able to give comments on the process to this point and information they have to share. When, at what point in the agenda would you want to do this? Is, is near the public comment period that typically is in there now or as a public hearing time slot or? What we did for redistricting was it just was its own, it would be in, for instance, this agenda number six. We'd say, you know, public comment, public comment on the, the uh, Route 3 um, visioning process and then board comment. But not, not a 7.30 type public no, hearing sir. thing. Okay, that's And it, it that's wouldn't a be a public hearing in that it would be advertised in the paper and all that, but it would be something on the website and part of the, the information that we distribute on the effort. I'm sorry, the I, I mean public I, comment periods are proposed to be scheduled after the dinner break, which yeah. in these afternoon, meet in the second meeting of the month, tend to be. Which somebody wanted to come in, they could come in after our dinner break, or if they come in and make the comment during the public comment period, which quite often happens before the right. dinner break. Right. So they have the, both options. Both options. Okay, yeah, that's that's probably better. I'd rather uh, more options than fewer. Yeah, right. Okay. I'll make the motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries five zero. <coughs> All right. On to appointments to boards, commissions, and committees. Do we have any appointments? I do. I'd like to reappoint Pat Lalanne to the library board. Any others? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> All right. Discussion items. Reopening of the Locust Grove Child Care site. Alicia. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, at my, when I did my quarterly report in May, I kind of hinted at um, that we were taking requests to open a new or reopen the child care program at Locust Grove. We closed it, I believe, about two years ago due to a lack of participation. Um, the licensed providers on the eastern end of the county, most of them are full at this time, and the kids don't have as many places to go. So we started receiving phone calls, sent out a flyer, and received a decent response back. What I would like from the board tonight is to further pursue this um, and open up a two-week enrollment period so that we can actually verify that the need is there by having the parents register their children so that we are just not guessing. <laughs> um, and if we do that, I'd like to open the site July 1st, which means we have to move very quickly. So we'll have two weeks to 
advertise for staff, um, do interviews, get our licensing together. Our licensing inspector has already stated she'll work with us the best she can to meet our deadline. Um, so at this point, I'm just requesting from the board to further pursue this. I'm okay with the further pursuing of this, mm -hmm. but I do have two questions. And That's the fine. first one is when you said you, you know how much you know what you have to have. Right. Where where is interest in where you? Um, we were we were we told the parents we were um, pursuing summer and um, schoolyard just to see where the interest was. Right now, with the responses I have, we have enough for summer. Um, in talking to the principal at the school, we will be going back in just to verify she is going to welcome us back and everything like that. She said there is a major interest down there. They're getting calls all the time, so she believes it won't be a problem for the school year as well. So right now for the summer, we are right where we need to be to make sure that we maintain our budget. So what we'd like to have is not only their expression of interest, but mm -hmm. their registration, their, set, commitment. their signature, and all that. Yes. My next question is, mm -hmm. two weeks seems like a real... I mean, here here's the deal. If if you, yes, you are, you know that whole daycare thing, and you're telling people July first, mm -hmm. and something happens, and July first doesn't work, and then right. you have, I mean, I would almost, when when you say, do you feel comfortable with two weeks? Because my 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 thing is, I've been that mom where you know you don't have daycare, and it's it, it's difficult, so. I would actually rather you add where you're comfortable mm -hmm. versus where you're killing yourself to get it done in two weeks and then something happens and it doesn't and it doesn't come to fruition. Right. And then you've left people out high and dry. No, and I don't want that to happen either. I'm okay with pushing it back a little bit. We're just trying to make it as easy as possible. The summer is one of the most difficult times for parents to find child care. It's longer hours, um, longer days, more expensive. And so we're trying to accommodate the parents as quickly as possible so that they don't go somewhere else. Well, I, yeah, I realize mm -hmm. that. But that's, that's kind of, the I think, something you're going to need to tell us. If you can do it by July 1st, that's one thing, but if you, you think you might be, able, you know, I, I. We already have most of the supplies um, that we will need to open the site. In speaking with the principal, she already has the location set. This site has already been licensed, so I don't foresee any issues with the licensing, mm -hmm. um, which I think is going to be our, our biggest hurdle, just getting her out and doing that. Um, but she said she would, would come out and she drops everything and comes whenever we call her anyway. Um, I believe that we can do it. It will take a lot of work over the next couple of weeks, um, but I'd like to just get this rolling and see where we can go with it. Um, there's a big need on that end of the county, and we keep getting phone calls about it. Do you have the staff identified? We are actually in the process right now of um, interviewing staff for the other sites as well for vacancy. So if we can maneuver those staff around right now, we can do that you as well enough, as. Do you have enough staff? I mean, enough. Uh, potential uh, interviewees that uh, we may have to advertise some uh, another time to do another round of interviews but we are getting ready to hire some that we could float around and I think we'd be able to cover it I can also cover the site um, and I have two directors that we can move around as well so between all of us the first week or so we can probably cover um, would like to get some solid staff in there that are going to be with the kids and be that steady rock for those kids so I believe we can make that work and then the only other thing I would like for you to look at the other site Mm -hmm. about extending their hours to 630 because okay. I will I will note parents at the eastern end of the county are not the only parents who who have a hard time so if the other site you know mm -hmm. especially if Gordonsville right you know, if Gordonsville oh I've been there and done that I, <laughs> been there till seven o'clock at night because of traffic or whatever not because of mine no not because no. of you I'm just um, saying that but I mean I, no. I would I would potentially like for us to have the same hours at all mm -hmm. and that was that was one of my things with the fees as well if these are our set times I'd like these to be our set fees as well we used to have when Locust Grove was open two different sets of fees it was very confusing when kids went back and forth and I'm okay if the parents need us being open later um, and we that's something we can explore with the other two sites as well I'm perfectly okay with that if the parents need us we'll be there the uh, you say you have a number of people uh, on a waiting list? Yes, sir. How, uh, how many do you have on your waiting list? Um, we have about 18 right this second. Um, how many do you need to make this? For the summer care, we need 12 full-time or, um, let's see, 12 full-time. Okay. And, or 42 part-time, but that means they all have to come a certain amount of days. Um, so right now, we are right where we need to be for summer care with the ones that have committed 
two to three days a week for part time and the ones who've committed for full time. Okay. So, and so the, you need to get back to them and also. Okay. And advertise for any new parents. And again, um, I talked to um, the principal at Locust Grove Primary, is where our, our site was housed before. And she said, You guys come on back in. You know, that's not a problem. She was really great today. And she said she's had a lot of phone calls. So she anticipates so that she's we'll. Got a, she's got some more names for you. Yes, okay. sir. Um, and um, we've actually been talked to by Brenda Boysig at Social Services as well for parents calling them as well. Anything that'll happen in. Uh, I'm going to take a 20, deep breath. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 19 days. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Um, so moved to have you pursue this, go forth and be prosperous. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All righty. All right. Uh, amendment to the payroll processing schedule. Glenda. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, um, we had discussed this previously, but um, as part of our software conversion and implementation, um, we are um, implementing a new payroll and human resource module. And uh, we have been looking at our current payroll processes and policies, and we do have some challenges in the way that our payroll is currently set up, and I've tried to sort of outline that for you in this memo. Um, as an example, our May 31st payroll will include um, several different uh, payroll periods all being paid on that one day, and that causes a lot of confusion, for, of course, for the employees that are being paid because they have different types of pay in one check. Um, but it also will make it extremely difficult for us to automate this process um, and really get the most bang out of our buck with our new software. Um, so what we we're proposing to do is to standardize the pay periods across all departments so that we have a standard uh, two-week pay period and two weeks after that we pay for that pay period so whatever time happens in that two-week period whether it's part-time overtime regular time it's getting paid on at the same time um, in order to do that uh, we would need to do an accrual of payroll expenses at the end of the year. Uh, that would be at the end of FY14, and we have estimated that that would be about $245,000. Um, that would be in order to create the processing window to give us the proper amount of lag time um, to record all the use of vacation leave, uh, sick leave, and all those other things that come into processing a payroll. Um, so that we're asking for your approval to do that um, beginning in January um, that way as we're setting up our new system we could set it up with that in mind how are you working 28 day cycles in that um, the the fact that a two-week cycle is two seven-day periods and then 28 days is four seven-day periods we're able to line them up um, Right, but how currently how how the um, how emergency services are paid? Right, there's actually that window of overtime that you don't have to pay for them. Right. So, so but what's going to happen is when you're paying them every other week, you're actually paying them that overtime. Well, because actually, they, they use that 28 days. They 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 adjust right. that time within that 28 day period. So are are, are we are the, we the software actually has an FLSA module for this purpose I mean it's really for public safety uh, people that enables it to track that 28 day cycle um, those groups of employees are considered separately mm -hmm. when calculating the overtime so it's still doing it on a, it's still going to do it on a 28 day cycle right. key thing is it FLSA compliant 
that's the if it if it is. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's that's the bottom line, and right. I assume it is. Everybody. Right. But what'll happen is you'll have those twenty eight days. They they there's a window in there with their overtime, and it's based on a twenty eight day cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you're paying them every two weeks, and they get a bunch of over, let's say they they their front end of their schedule has a bunch of overtime, mm -hmm. they theoretically would have adjusted that time off at the back end of their schedule. But if you're already paying them, they're they're not adjusting off because they've been compensated for that overtime. Right. My understanding is that the software does a look back, so it you know it takes that into consideration before paying overtime. Because you will find that there will be a drastic increase in, in an overtime budget if it doesn't take that into consideration. Right. If, if you have and if you haven't budgeted for it, you could have a problem. Right. This accrual uh, is that a is that a one time implementation it issue is. only? Uh, and you, Let's do a line, everybody. <laughs> Let all the all the all right. three mm -hmm. windows all fall into mm. place. And uh, one thing I didn't see, and maybe you addressed it, uh, you you've, you found ways to mitigate the impact on the employees so that they're not ending up waiting four extra days for a paycheck or losing three days that they worked that they normally would, all, all of those kind of issues that I, I at least you have a plan to deal with? Let me ask yes, I believe, um, you know, it, it's about as painless as we could make it, but the first pay would be January 17th and then there would be another pay January 31st. So they would still be paid twice in January uh, because it's a 26 time cycle within the year, it's slightly less net, but then you get paid again two weeks into February. So, I, you know, I think um, I don't I don't foresee you know a huge problem with the employees being able to um, adjust. So to we're that. talking about a three day is the maximum delay somebody would see. Um, Yes, mm -hmm. so one, I think one, that's about basically right. Basically, one time, mm -hmm. one time he would see a three-day delay, mm -hmm. and it would, and there's plenty of advance notification of that. Right. The guy isn't going to be. Oops, I got to stop eating for three days. Mm -hmm. I think that probably from the standpoint of. Uh, People not having to wait for overtime or uh, or uh, the part-time people seems to me to be uh, overall they're going to get their money a lot sooner. Well, the biggest thing is lining up everything for doing payroll. Well, I understand that, but from the from the individual perspective, uh, yeah, that, okay, lining up payroll is great for staff that's got to do it, but for the individual perspective, if if he puts in overtime, he doesn't have to wait two pay periods to get it. Mm -hmm. This he'll get it right at that pay period, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard the, uh, the EMT say, well, you know, I got all this overtime in. When am I going to get it? You know, mm -hmm. so. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's still working. Um, are, are you planning on coming back to us with? implementation plan or do I, I see that the, you, what you're looking for tonight is just a, a uh, well no you're actually okay you want to you're, you're, you're looking for the actual motion to approve it, to approve it. okay well I, I, I mean I certainly um, I can come back uh, and you know give you implementation plans and calendars and all that sort of thing well, um, no. we had our kickoff meeting today actually with the Munis project manager and you know it was very broad level of course she's very anxious to know which if we're going to be able to accomplish this because it really will have a lot um, it, you know it will drive the basis of how we build tables and uh, calculations in the new system and that sort of thing what about the schools does this have any impact on the schools uh your no, um, we've you know they have been in our meetings um, that we've had so far with our our project managers with Munis and uh, they don't seem to have the same issues just because they're working with contracts 
and you know their payroll is just a whole different animal so they're not and so all, the, all staff is okay with this I mean have we have we we have uh, we have talked a little bit about it at our department head meetings that it was a possibility that we would do it um, Julie might be able to tell better than we have than I. Weekly meeting. Yeah, I've, I've done both, and every two weeks is so much easier in, in, in every way, basically. Check ins up in your bank on Friday. Yeah, just the time things. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it removes a, a lot of confusion. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can always go change your mortgage payment date. You can change other things. So, I mean, it, it makes it simple. It's no more when's the 15th, when, when's the 30th, but ooh, no 31st. February is a great month because you get a paycheck early. Uh, everything's lined up every two weeks ago. It's done. I mean, I think, um, you know, from a processing point of view, there'll be parts of payroll that we're doing more often, and in that way, you know, it will be um, more work. But on the other hand, we're going to see so many um, efficiencies from automating things that. Um, you know, I think it's going to easily make up for it, and I think you know the the benefit to the employees is well worth it. Well, I think especially for the part time people. The the part timers are just frustration with the <coughs> monthly billing, as have the um, folks who accrue scheduled overtime to be by AMS folks. But yeah, I, I think that those those are the big benefits in terms of the part timers and the uh, and the guys that have do overtime and they could see that money sooner so I would make the motion second we have a motion and a second any further discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. okay <laughs> and next we have uranium mining Shannon it's everyone's favorite topic every year it seems that uranium is is, let's just keep the band. Is, is there some upcoming decision that we're trying to impact? Well, it's, I mean, it's already, um, yes, yes. Here's the deal. I mean, it, it's no secret once, you know, when, when you want something um, and you weren't successful. Oh, I know they're going to keep coming back. They're going to keep coming back. I was um, just... Uh, it's, it's not obviously an upcoming um, decision. It, it's one of the things that, you know, just because the General Assembly isn't in session right now, it's not that they are not being lobbied by the other side. Um, you know, one, I, th I think, I don't know if people say this to us because they're trying to pump us up, but, you know, we've been told by um, several people that are um, supporting the moratorium on uranium mining that Orange County has been the most out front on and on top of the uranium issue and um i i don't i mean i'm yeah i'm anti uranium mining yeah but at the same time i mean if we're just throwing out resolutions uh, uh you know like uh confetti uh i'm just uh concerned whether we're it's a new and improved updated resolution <laughs> I, i'm okay with it but we need to clean up a few things if we want to send it to this list of recipients. Uh, at the bottom of page one, the last whereas escrow fines are not set aside, but if I any yes might be, but and then two above that, uh, we, we need to say what we're talking about. Research shows that tailing pond liners last between 100 and 200 years but are reported to remain radioactive for, I don't think we, the liners remain radioactive. I think we want to say what we're talking about. Uh, I don't know. Depends I, on I think it's talking about the tailings. Well, no, but just saying, you know, the, the linings themselves, uh, I don't know what the lining material is, but you can well, irradiate I'm, it. Right, but, but I think the point we're trying to make is the tailings remain a whole lot oh, yeah, that's the, that's longer than the, than the lining. And I would delete the one above that it talks about contrary creek because there it's talking about it's not talking about radioactive it's talking about acid I'm fine with those changes 
just, I mean, nothing. I'm not yeah. changing the substance at all. No, 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 no. No, I'm fine with that. Um, you know, we had a we had one um, recommended to us. Right, who, I saw who's, that. Who's the staff? Yeah. Um, who yeah. is uh, is? Uh, I know that uh, uh, Bill Speeden is working this, but uh, is there a is there a an organized group that? Yes, uh, very, very, very organized. Okay, and they have requested this at this point. Uh, I'm Bill hoping is Bill is the man. Well, Bill I mean, is the man. Bill is. I mean, I'm I'm here to tell y'all. You know, he. I give Bill Speeden props. He. Okay, he I'm has just his um, connections okay. with them, and and they and and you know. I've lost the, what the word I is I'm looking for, but he's a he's an authority with uranium mining and, oh, and I understand. people. His name is known. I don't think the uranium mining lobbyists like him very much. That's, I'd say that's a fair statement. I'd say that's <laughs> not, a, fair not a problem with me. <laughs> okay, I, I just want to make sure that we're not uh, we're thrilled. I mean, we're throwing these out at the appropriate points rather yeah. than you know. We we oh, actually. Oh, this is another thing from Orange County. You know. Well, I mean, am, am, am I so naive to believe, oh, wow, well, if we've got this um, resolution, therefore we must do exactly what they say. No, I, don't um, I don't think they pay attention to any resolution that we send them. But I tell you what, if you don't send them, they definitely don't pay attention to it. Well, so, I, I, always, I always look to see when we send a resolution and how they vote. And that's always very helpful because I – like to use those kind of comments for my articles. We are we are very we are very fortunate. Um, you know, Ed Ed Scott really 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 supports our continued you know effort sure. on this. Yeah, I, he, I've talked to him a couple of times about it directly, and, and uh, um, he's uh, he's he's been pretty conscientious about this more than just more than just listening to our resolutions. Yes, very much so. So um, I will. I guess make the motion as amended by um, Jim to send this forward. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. <coughs> Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And lastly, for discussion items, let's talk about the doggy park. Doggy park. Just want to know what's going on. Good afternoon and almost evening now. Um, I've been researching dog parks for several years, even with Harrisonburg before I came here, and they have a plan in effect to put one in in their new park they're doing as well. But I want to concentrate now on a specific area here, and the area in question is a strip of land to the right side of the road coming into Booster Circle, uh, Booster Park Circle. It's between the parks that's on one side of the road and the airport's on the other side. It's a 90 foot wide by 780 feet long, which is a little over a quarter, I mean an eighth of a mile. It's a long strip through there. Uh, in talking with Mr. Hildebrand, Public Works, it's an area that's not owned by the airport, but they have to maintain, they bush hog it, and unless I would build a doggy high dive, I don't think the FAA, he said, would have no bearing on it or anything, a problem with it. So they actually encourage the idea um, so they don't have to maintain that part. But as part of the park plan, in my mind, I would also see a strip of parking spaces along the right side of that road to, to use to park. But also, in talking with Buzz, it would be great overflow parking for big events at the airport because you have folks coming dressed up and they park along that road and get out in nice clothes into the mud parked along the side. It would help alleviate one of the problems with Booster Park, the dogs on the field thing. It would give the dog owners a specific place to take their dogs, and um, it would help alleviate that problem. And I would just like permission to research that. Uh, the other point, um, we're not asking for any money. The foundation would take that on, undertaking that. Uh, Ms. Hamilton with the Animal Shelter has agreed she would do fundraising as well. Uh, there are grants out there. There are different things. I think the dog owners and dog lovers of Orange could put this park in for us. Uh, I just need to sit. Who owns the land? The County of Orange. Okay. Well, you, when you said the airport didn't own it. So no, well, they, they said it's not airport property and it's <coughs> not considered part of the Platt or the GIS says County of Orange. Okay. So we're talking about a fence. Uh, so mm -hmm. basically, the cost is your fencing. Well, the cost is whatever we want to make the cost. Um, we can go for a couple thousand dollars, or we could go for the Taj Mahal of dog parks, whatever we want to <laughs> fundraise for. I mean, it, it would be the foundation doing the fundraising. We would mm -hmm. get grants. 
I would definitely call probably land planning and design or one of those groups. That's who work with us, LPND from Charlottesville and Harrisonburg to design it. I have the idea in my mind what I would like to see, but they're the experts. They know what works. There's, there's some terrain issues there and some things like that. That Maybe this question is for the county attorney. Um, I was thinking you're looking at me because I know so much about dog parks, oh, but go ahead. Uh, sorry. Well, you, you're looking at me. Thank you. I assume that there are some at least basic guidelines that need to be followed to whether, whether there's a – the, is the foundation going to be a managing organization? Are you, through Parks and Recs, going to be a managing organization? Somebody has to exert some level of oversight and therefore probably takes on some level of liability. Well, how, do we, how do we wrestle through all that, I guess, is my... Mr. Mubri can correct me. What my ears heard was the foundation is going to raise the money to build it and Parks and Rec is going to run it. Correct. That's what I heard. So that's... And the foundation would do continued fundraising efforts towards maintenance. Do we know at this point what running it might look and, like? And, that, and that's why I would just want a permission to research that specific property right now because it, it all depends on what we put in it. You know, if it doesn't have to be mowed, if we go with the crushed granite type material, that doesn't need mowing. If we have grass areas, which I anticipate some grass areas, there will be lag time of the different places. You fence them off so you use one and then let the other rest. And there's a whole lot of re I just want permission to research that specific area and come back to you all before we did anything. But I'm okay. I'm, I'll make I'm a motion okay. that you go ahead and um, go forth and be prosperous and come back with a doggone good idea. The best doggone park around. <laughs> Well, we hope dog not gone to go <laughs> chase. No, so. dog on, <laughs> dog on. <coughs> we, we don't want a Kmart commercial here. So. You haven't heard the Kmart commercial? The big gas discounts? You haven't heard it? Okay. They're good. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Any question on the information items? I would just like to thank Greg for preparing um, his re our requested memo. Um, I, I think that it does a lot. Um, I hope that people can read that and actually see what you and your staff have accomplished to um, try to streamline processes and um, I appreciate your hard work and appreciate your memo. Thank you, sir. And also the participation from across the organization. There yeah. were a lot of people involved with this. So that was it's a good thing. It was. Okay. Uh, committee reports. Hmm. All right. In that case, we move on to calendar. <coughs> continuing to um, finalize the preparations for their big opening um, in July. And at one time we had talked about the structure of the July 9th meeting to be able to accommodate um, a VIP reception or, or some sort of event at the Walmart that night. I was informed today that the events will all be taking place as far as speeches and all that good stuff on the 10th. So we no longer have to adjust our schedule to accommodate the, the board going to the East Vernonia County on the 9th. Okay. And what time are they looking at on, on the, the 10th? 10th? I'm not sure. I think they I heard 10 o'clock. It will definitely be in the morning, I believe, because they're going to want shoppers to shop all day. You know, they're going to open and then people are going to be able to shop. But I would anticipate it being in the morning. All right. <coughs> um, let's see. We are looking at public hearing on the 23rd. I will not be here, so I'll ask again if we change the meeting to the 30th or I'm going to change the public hearing. The, the one public hearing on um, the Code of Ordinances for non-payment of taxes, we do have time with advertising to move that to the 9th if you would like to have it done. 
that's fine with me. We <coughs> discussed um, Mr. Dotson's public hearing, and he is unavailable now. Where are we on the discussion about the 23rd, the meeting on the 23rd? Is there going to be one, or are we going to move it to the 30th, or are we undecided at this point? What is there? Well, we, we decided <laughs> previously not to do anything unless there was something of significance. And the rezoning is significant. So I, we can either move it or I'll, I can change the public hearing to another date. <coughs> Sounds like we should do one or the other. We, we can't turn, do it on the, oh, you mean the 9th of, um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, he cannot do it on the, the 9th. 9th we, can, we can do it in either uh, July 30th or, in, or the first meeting in August. I say we do it the first meeting in August. That's fine. Ken, Kenny was fine with that. <coughs> He's still accommodating. Okay, well, in that case. This is the. Uh, if that's all right with the rest of y'all, we'll just change that date and leave the meeting on the 23rd. And so we're making that date August, August 13th, you're saying? Which is August 16th? The public hearing. August 13th will be um, 12 rezoning 1301 SJS Limited Company. Okay. And then On July 9th will be the public hearing for sections 58-53. Okay. So no public hearings on the 23rd. No. <coughs> All right. So if there's nothing else, <coughs> we have six minutes to do close. Can we do it in six minutes before I have to leave? We can indeed. Okay. Yeah. If I do have to go to the Kemper Lawson and go to bed. We're at the Board of Supervisors of Lawrence County desires to discuss and close the meeting of the following matters. Consequently, <coughs> legal counsel obtained actual and probable litigation for this consultation and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating power of the public body. In consultation, legal counsel employee retained by the public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the legal advice by such counsel. So whereas pursuant to 2.237A1 and A7 of the Code of Virginia for successful current closed meeting, may have to therefore be resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Lawrence County is to authorize discussion of the aforesaid